You're watching Double Standards with me, Afshin Ratansi. This week, child soldiers recruited in Britain. Coming up in the show, Britain hosting its largest arms fair. Bahrain is invited and will be buying more weaponry to carry out murder. And ahead of an autumn of demonstrations by British people protesting their government, we talk to the former leader of the largest students' union in Europe. And the militarization of British schools as the government steps up its campaign to recruit child soldiers. The biggest story in the world affecting every single one of us is, of course, the economic crisis. In Europe, Standard & Poor's, famous for wrongly rating risk and so aiding us into the crisis, has downgraded Italy. And for some reason, the media behave as if there is no actual solution. Here's U.S. Vice President Joe Biden, courtesy of Heads Up. Ladies and gentlemen, now it's true that the uh, recovery is not looking as sharp as we'd like, but uh, the truth is we and everyone else misread the economy. That's actually not true, Mr. Vice President. Lots of liberal economists and columnists like Paul Krugman and Joseph Stiglitz said that the stimulus was poorly designed and actually not big enough. But instead of listening to them, you listen to the likes of Larry Summers, who actually helped cause the crash with the overturning of Glass Steagall in the 90s, and Timothy Geithner with his ties to Goldman Sachs. Well, well, now, sure, in hindsight, having those who helped cause the problem in the first place in charge of fixing it may seem like a boneheaded idea, but uh, clearly we and everyone else misread their appointments. That's actually not true either. Lots of liberal... Yep, everybody got it wrong. Every single one of us. And the economy over here is hardly doing any better. The mayor of London, who some say is vying for the leadership of the governing Conservative Party, challenged the Prime Minister to a tennis match to decide economic policy. Not sure who really won there, but we do know that David Cameron must have given the nod to Bahrain and Saudi Arabia being invited to the UK's largest arms fair that's been on in the past few days just down the river here. Fair given that Britain created Bahrain, I suppose. London was the place to be if you want to go around killing people. We have an industry that as a nation we should be proud of, said Rhys Ward, chief executive of ADS, the Defence and Security Trade Group. Actually, rather than show the London exhibition, let's see where weapons are sold when I'm reading this stuff out. Ah, yes, here are the Tactica armoured personnel carriers arriving to crush the democracy movement in Bahrain. Oh, and there is a soldier telling us that all public gatherings are banned. This year, Saudi Arabia used Tactica armoured vehicles made by BAE Systems to send its National Guard into Bahrain to suppress pro-democracy protests. Let's have a look at what the soldiers in them did while I read their PR. The Tactica family is a complete range of versatile, cost-effective 4x4 wheeled vehicles, ideally suited for use by military and security forces in many roles. Its non-aggressive profile makes it suitable for use in police and security roles where other vehicles might be unacceptable, while its armor protection, reliability, and impressive on- and off-road mobility make it equally suited to military roles. Anyway, the Prime Minister of Bahrain came to power on the 16th of August 1971, over 40 years ago, making him a leader in power for as long as Gaddafi of Libya. But instead of a NATO attack, the US has been secretly extending its Fifth Fleet naval base on the island. Well, from demonstrations in Bahrain to an autumn of demonstrations ahead of us here in Britain, a general strike even perhaps, as the opposition Labour Party at conference shows no signs of real opposition to capitalism, we have up next the former leader of Europe's largest student union. With me is Claire Solomon, who led the largest student union in Europe, and uh, that's up until recently. This autumn, what should we expect uh, when it comes to opposition to the uh, cuts being made uh, down the river there in Parliament? Well, there are a number of large protests already organised. On the 2nd of October, we have the 
demonstration outside the Tory party headquarters, which I'm sure, a Tory party conference, sorry, which I'm sure will uh, galvanise a lot of people to go and shout at the Tories. We have an anti-war assembly on the 8th of October, which is the anniversary of the invasion of Afghanistan. Already we have thousands of people pledged to attend what hopes to be a sort of occupation of Trafalgar Square. Um, there are a number of student demonstrations coming up next year, and we are waiting to see whether the unions will all join together to call national days of action, national strikes, national demonstrations. Of course, not that all these demonstrations end, end in violence, and that's not, not the point of it. But we have seen in the past, especially when, when you were student leader, uh, riots just across the river here at Millbank, new laws, new sentencing uh, for violence on protests, even arranging protests on the streets of London. Uh, do you think organisers and people who want to protest should be put off uh, or uh, will be frightened? Well, you, people are getting charged with even not arranging protests, as the two young people in Cheshire recently received two years sentencing each for putting something on Facebook that didn't actually create or, or organise anything. And they've been sentenced to two years. This is an outrage that the government think that they can intimidate us like this. But for every case like this, people will will get together and fight back against this. You know, of course, when the courts uh, gave these sentences, these long uh, custodial sentences to those people that arrange Facebook uh, activities, shall we say, the media seemed pretty unanimous. In any case, they were using high-tech methods. Well, they might be high-tech, but they're just forms of communication. I mean, people have been organising demonstrations for centuries, if not longer. I don't think it really matters which method of communication they're using. And if the government thinks that they can threaten to switch off Twitter, Facebook, then, you know, they've got another thing coming. And these are the same people who, are, who have been praising the revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia and for the use of technology there. So once again, you can see the hypocrisy from our government. But then were you surprised about uh, how, uh, again, it could just be media bias. Uh, a lot of people within the media, people being interviewed, um, people writing in to a program saying sentencing has been too lenient on people involved in, whether it be called the uprising or, or the riots over the summer. Were you surprised? Well, if they think six months for a £1.50 bottle of water is lenient, then I would dread to think actually what they would want to happen. I think these people are obviously by, uh, listening to what the media are saying. and I think they need to think about what sort of sentencing do we want for the other criminals in society, for the big criminals, for the criminals that kill millions of people in other countries, that steal £1.3 trillion pounds worth of our taxpayers money to bail out the banks that you know claim MPs expenses for seven thousand pound plasma screen TVs what about their sentencing thank yeah? you very much you. Claire Solomon for coming to double standards thank you So an autumn of protests planned in this country back before the present coalition government that wasn't actually elected here in the UK. One Nick Clegg said that a vote for the Conservatives would be a vote for riots. No riots here yet, but if the Conservatives scrape into power and, as the Lib Dem leader puts it, they slash and burn public services on a thin mandate, a violent backlash is not inconceivable. There is a danger in having any government of whatever composition led by a party which doesn't have a proper mandate across the country trying to push through really difficult decisions. I think a lot of people will react badly to that. But rioting in the streets? It's a bit much. Uh, I think there's a very serious risk. I think it's rather silly thing to say, frankly. The Prime Minister, before he took office, telling us his now Deputy Prime Minister was silly to talk about rioting. Well, David Mulholland, the comedian, is on the show to talk about double standards and take a look at this week's best political cartoons from around the world. Welcome, David Mulholland, to Double Standards. And you've brought in a cartoon, your first cartoon, anyway, of a big, fat Arab gentleman and a big American boat on top of him. Yes, well, I think this is uh, one of the members of the Bahraini uh, royal family uh, with the Fifth Fleet on his back. Either the Prime Minister or the Crown Prince or the King, maybe, when he was younger. The problem is with uh, identifying them is there is a strong family resemblance among them. If this is so, some sort uh, of anti-Arab racism, uh, our viewers will write in. You're not saying they all look the same, are No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that the, the, the fact is that, that the Bahraini royal family has a strong family resemblance. They are, in fact, a family. Oh, yeah, because they weren't actually elected. Well, anyway, yeah. the uh, Fifth Fleet base, apparently, is being secretly expanded. That's what our sources are telling us. Being expanded. Let's hope it's not by Halliburton, because it would probably be another Guantanamo Bay. 
Guantanamo Bay uh, in uh, Bahrain, presumably for the uh, dictators and police that are mowing down the protesters. No, I think probably for the protesters, but I'm cynical that way. Yeah. And here's a Saudi clip. And this is basically the, the Saudis providing the gun for the Bahraini royal family and, of course, shooting their own people, shooting their protesters. And the blood uh, coming down on that flag. Yes, either that or it's a anti-smoking advert. Um, yeah, or... Uh, or just, yeah, breath mint. Okay, now we have the third one. Um, I think this a is... a fat Saudi. Yes, and I think this is sort of the crux of the whole thing. Uh, it's about obesity in Saudi Arabia, presumably. A, a growing problem, actually. Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of lipids there. The, um, a but, lipid? What's a lipid? It's an oil. All right. Yeah. Make you fat, but also they have them in the ground. I think it's a different type yeah. of oil. Okay, Gaddafi, read this out. What's this? Yeah, so uh, we have the Saudi saying, nothing to see here. Look at Gaddafi. Yes, Gaddafi, nothing here but oil. And uh, in the background, of course, you've got the Bahraini police beating up the protesters. And I think this is, a, this is interesting, because while the rest of the world is distracted, what we see is a, a big country invading a small country to get their oil resources, showing that the Middle East truly is learning Western values. So hooray for free Libya is your next uh, cartoon. Right, exactly. I mean, and here's the, the uh, I think, the, the double standard that's at play here is that we have Libya uh, with Sarkozy going, oh, yes, free, hooray for free Libya. But in fact, it's all about oil concessions or, the, or plans for oil they concessions. They said it was about freedom, and they said they don't want to take over uh, Libya. They want it, Libya for the Libyans, unlike the dictator of Gaddafi. Right, right. And, uh, and I'm sure they believe that as long as there are oil concessions involved. However, I've got to say, Western Sounds plans like for the Middle East haven't always worked out for the best. I mean, you know, I mean, sometimes they work out, you know. I mean, they, they've worked out very well in Afghanistan. Well, maybe not. N not. Not so well in Afghanistan. But, you know, look at how well plans have worked out in Iraq. Well, okay, no, they haven't really yeah, worked out for It's been a complete Iraq. disaster. And uh, what have we got coming up here uh, on, uh, uh, yeah, the dollar? We're going to go straight to the dollar. You've got uh, people, wait, uh, your dollars are being printed. Someone in an ATM machine. Well, yes, I mean, Cheney has been a big fan of, uh, well, destroying the U.S. economy, uh, contracting practices that just mean give money to Halliburton, uh, cutting taxes on the very wealthy, and uh, basically borrowing huge amounts of money. And the problem is that the Republicans in Congress uh, are totally irresponsible and unwilling to raise taxes. So basically the U.S. is going broke. And the U.S. economy is, is uh, very, very much struggling and continuing downwards. And so this is basically a cartoon illustrating that, uh, yeah, please wait while your dollars are being printed, because it's about the only solution that the U.S. has left. Anyway, thank you mm. very much, David, for uh, coming on. Thank you very much, Afshin. Well, the Chinese backing of the U.S. dollar may be coming under strain after ratings agencies downgraded America's creditworthiness, but this video seems like it's taking it too far. In Glorious Mission, a video game backed by the People's Liberation Army and used in training in China, the objective is to kill as many U.S. soldiers as possible. Perhaps it means that the Chinese Communist Party is saying if it doesn't get its money back from America, it's going to go in for the kill. So that's what will happen if the Americans don't pay their debt back to China. Chinese soldiers killing American soldiers there back here in Britain. The government is recruiting child soldiers to fight in Afghanistan. I spoke to Ben Griffin, formerly of the SAS, about it. Ben Griffin, welcome to Double Standards. You're a spokesperson for Veterans for Peace. You are also in the SAS. Militarization in UK schools, this is one of the campaigns I know the Veterans for Peace are concerned about. What is militarization of UK schools? What are they doing in Britain's schools? Yeah, sure. For the last couple of years, I've been working with an organization called Forces Watch, which looks into the recruitment practices of the British Army. And uh, something they've come across and I've come across through working for them is how uh, the military is starting to push into schools uh, to take over lessons and uh, to try and push the idea that the military and, and you know, uh, becoming a soldier is a, is a sort of honorable career option for the youth of today. Haven't they always done that? For the last 10 years, um, they've been following the American model. If you go to America, you'll have recruiting sergeants walking down the corridors, you'll have posters up. Um, there'll be videos and um, films shown to school kids. Recruitment in Britain has historically been outside of the school. Um, I remember myself going to a country fair when I was seven and seeing a bloke jump out of an airplane and then getting to play with the guns on the, 
you know, in a, on a stool. That's that's how it's done. Yeah, in fact, I saw uh, there was one piece saying how they do it in Britain. Um, what was it? Uh, recruitment strategy, someone from the British Army saying, our new model is about raising awareness, and that takes a 10-year span. It starts with a 7-year-old uh, seeing a parachutist and thinking, that looks great. Um, exactly. As a means of... Uh, qualifying what they might have heard about Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, so uh, in my opinion, the recruiters going into the school, this isn't a first contact with the military. Uh, we live in a militarized society. I remember when I was five, my granddad put me on his knee, showed me his medals, told me about what he'd done in World War II, and that started in me a, a sort of idea that the military was a noble profession and what Britain did in the world was always right. You know, this is my granddad. You know, he wasn't a bad person. And then you get this drip, 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 of indoctrination over the years, uh, war films on a Sunday afternoon, meeting the soldiers at a country fair. And when the recruiters go into school, they're just reinforcing what the mainstream media is pressing, pushing all the time, you know, that our soldiers are heroes and what they, they can do no wrong. Some of our richer viewers who are in Manhattan or in uh, Knightsbridge or the Champs-Élysées will be saying, these richer areas don't seem to have uh, anything, they don't seem to recognise anything of what you're saying, that not many army recruitment uh, offices in these... Uh, richer parts of town. Any explanation? Well, uh, recruitment uh, within the UK uh, and the British Army as a whole is actually very skewed. So uh, when I was in the Army, I wasn't in a local regiment, I was in the parachute regiment at first, which recruits from all over the UK. But most of the voices you would hear would be Welsh, from the north of England, from Scotland and from Ireland. Um, so people are recruited into the Army uh, from these areas, probably because there's fewer job opportunities in those areas. If you're from this affluent southeast. Um, you're less likely to, to join the army. Although, I mean, you're saying you did some work for Forces Watch. They did get, uh, or at least applaud, the closing down of an office in Hackney. Um, why do you think they'd be in Hackney recruiting people for uh, the army? Yeah, the army's had this idea that there's this untapped resource of um, people, uh, children from backgrounds who might not have a history of joining the army. Um, maybe from ethnic uh, minorities and they thought that they could go into Hackney and maybe take advantage of the fact that there wasn't many employment opportunities maybe the uh, kids can st afford to stay on in school so they'd open this showroom and try and um, sort of indoctrinate the kids and try and indoctrinate the kids into thinking the army was a good choice you know they had things in there like computer games that you could play that sort of um, glorified war and, and uh, simplified the whole you know, process of killing and war they are absolutely bizarre, I think, some of our viewers. Certainly, I think all of this is, especially in the context, of course, of the riots. I suppose there will be government schemes saying put more of these army recruitment uh, officers into the areas seen as deprived to stop them rioting. Which is actually a crazy idea. Um, I think part of the reason we've seen such extreme violence over the last few days is, you know, for 10 years our government has been acting in a violent and lawless way on the international stage. What kind of example is that setting to the youth of our country? You know, the, the politicians are saying it's okay to a country, go to a country, bomb it, steal stuff, uh, kill people. What sort of example is that setting to our, to our youth? Well, some would say that we need an army and where else are we going to recruit them from but the youth of this country? Although you say that uh, Britain is slightly unusual as regards the European Union, specifically in terms of the age of the soldiers. Child soldiers is quite an emotive term, though. Um, I think Britain is alone within the European Union at recruiting under 18. Uh, so they're recruiting 15 kids. and 7 months. I yeah, think. they're recruiting kids who aren't allowed to smoke, drink or vote. You know, these kids, um, I don't think you could actually say that their opinions were truly formed and they had a real idea of what they're getting into. So um, the British Army takes advantage of these young adults, these children, um, before they get to the 18, 19, where maybe they've actually realised that the army isn't the option for them. And tell us about uh, Veterans for Peace, this new organisation. Yeah, for a long time I've been working within the peace organisation and um, speaking to veterans, and I felt that there was a need for an organisation run by veterans, for veterans, in opposing war. I think it's a powerful message when veterans come out and um, speak up against wars. We've been there. We know what these wars are like. And um, that's why I wanted to start the organisation off. We're still small in numbers now, but I'm hoping to grow the organisation over the next year. Would you encourage uh, people to join the army who are watching this, say, in Britain at the moment? Uh, no, I wouldn't encourage anyone to join the army. Um, I was speaking to a Tory MP, Patrick Mercer, not so long ago, and he was telling me about all the advantages of being in the army, uh, the comradeship and the travel abroad. But he failed to mention the disadvantages when you leave the army. 
the army provides you housing, the army provides you comradeship, and the army provides you money and travel. But all of that stops when you leave the army, and then you're left to pick up the pieces yourself. Um, a lot of the skills you learn in the army aren't transferable to civ civilian life. A lot of veterans are left with um, alcohol problems and mental health problems. 10% uh, of the prison population is made up of veterans. So the, um, the after effects, as it were, of serving in the army are not sort of advertised well, We beforehand. had the head of three para on this program, uh, the former head of three para, Stuart Tootle, and he seemed to be saying that uh, even the uh, funeral costs uh, that we watch on Wooden Bassett, they're not paid for by the army. What, why do you think uh, veterans are so unable to even get those benefits uh, for themselves and their families when they return from uh, service? The army recruits from poor parts of the country on the whole. Um, these are people who aren't sort of represented in parliament, really. Um, their views are not taken seriously. Um, once the army has used these people, they're, they're expendable. They're not... The army's always been seen, uh, and when I first joined the army, we were seen as second-class citizens. We couldn't get into certain pubs, certain clubs. You know, we were looked down on. Um, okay, that's changed over the last few years, probably for the worse, actually, that they're now being seen as these heroes that can do no wrong. But I think that Britain's got a long history of not looking after its uh, veterans. There are, of course, a lot of cases coming up now about mistreatment of people by British soldiers. You were in the SAS, you were in the services... Are you surprised that British soldiers are being seen as, uh, well, certainly around the world, as people engaged in uh, practices that are banned by UN conventions? I'm not allowed to talk about certain things that I know as a result of my service due to a high court injunction, but what I can say is, is that when we went into Iraq, there was this uh, message being pushed that British forces, forces would somehow act as a break on the American forces to stop them from going too far, you know, to calm it all down. The, the British forces are better than the American forces, yeah. better trained. I think the reality on the ground was that a force that is only 10% the size of the Americans is not going to influence the larger force. If anything, it's the larger force that's going to influence the smaller force. And I think the British have become more like the Americans in the last 10 years. You can see that now with the deployment of our own drones, you know, our own predator drones in Afghanistan. You know, rather than putting a break on the Americans, we've actually just become more like them. And as they keep cutting, as part of the general austerity cuts, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force and the Marines, how, how do you see this progressing in terms of the British uh, uh, armed services? Well, Britain, we're faced with a huge deficit. We haven't, we're short of money, we're having to cut spending, we're having to, well, I think we'll have to raise taxes at some point. And yet we've still got this huge military um, in proportion much bigger than countries of a similar size to our own. And we're still dealing with, we've still got this hang-up over empire, you know, that somehow we're this world's policeman that should be sorting out other people's problems. And I think as a country that we've got to grow up a bit and realise that actually other people's business is not our own and that we should concentrate more on um, our own country. And I think actually that people around the world are probably a bit fed up with us now, um, fed up with us interfering in other people's business. Of course, some people were saying that the riots, uh, recent riots here, in Britain should have been uh, policed by the army. Would you have supported that? No, I wouldn't have supported that. Um, I don't think it's ever a good idea to bring the army into domestic politics in any country. Um, that pro would probably be a backward step. Uh, I think the police should just have handled it a bit better. Maybe they didn't take it seriously enough at the start. Ben Griffin, thank you very much for coming to Double Standards. Thank you. So that former SAS soldier saying that bringing the army onto the streets of Britain would probably be a bad idea. Oh, and on that London arms fair that's selling weapons to Bahrain, there were some protests, as you can see. But it seems they were also selling banned cluster munitions, the ones seemingly specially for killing children. The store was closed down, but we're not sure how many were sold before it was shut. That's it for this week. You can email us at comment at doublestandardstv.com. I'll leave you with an alternate army recruitment video. There's dead and there's army dead. It's more than killing innocent people, it's about brutalizing nations. It's not just about the bombs, it's about oil. The strength of the army leads to profits for Halliburton. There's nothing deadlier than the U.S. Army. Just ask an Iraqi. There's dead and then there's army dead.